Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today is William Irwin. He's the Herb A. LeBlanc Distinguished Service Professor at King's College in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and author of the new book, The Free Market Existentialist, Capitalism Without Consumerism. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Thanks for having me, Aaron and Trevor. So I had, prior to reading this book, not had much exposure at all to existentialism. Um, I think I had read a handful of these people a little bit in passing but had never had an extended session of Sartre or anyone else. So let's maybe start, Bill, with just telling us what is existentialism? I mean is it is it just kind of an excuse for French guys to smoke cigarettes and look cool? That's the way a lot of people think about it, I'm afraid, and uh, it, it gets stereotyped as that kind of fad in philosophy. Uh, but I, th I think it actually uh, is something that you find, although uh, encapsulated in French thinkers of the 20th century throughout the history of philosophy. But basically, if I could give you a textbooky uh, sounding definition, it's a philosophy that reacts to an absurd and meaningless world uh, by urging acts of freedom and self-creation to overcome uh, feelings of, abs of absurdity and oppression. Uh, despair and alienation. Uh, so I think you find currents of that sort of impulse all the way back in the Old Testament books of Job and Ecclesiastes. You find it in thinkers like Pascal, uh, but most notably it, it comes to be a, a movement uh, both in philosophy and, and literature uh, in the 20th century. Now, existentialism, some people of the on the analytic side of f the philosophy department would say it's not even really philosophy, that it's more like poetry meets self-help kind of thing. How would you describe – how would you address that, that criticism? Right. It has that sort of uh, negative cast to it in a lot of people's minds because uh, a lot of the writing is, uh, is a bit obscure. Uh, it also gets uh, its expression uh, in literary and artistic form and uh, it – doesn't trade in arguments the way in which analytic philosophy tends to. So it, it gets that stereotype. On the other hand, it really does grapple with the big questions uh, that people are more likely to associate uh, with philosophy, uh, questions about the meaning of life, the existence of God, free will. So we can acknowledge that it has some shortcomings in terms of argumentative clarity uh, and nonetheless see that philosophy is a big tent uh, that has room underneath it for existentialism. When you use terms like the absurd or meaninglessness to describe life, that sounds pretty dark, yeah. depressing, pessimistic. Is that an accurate read or are those terms being used slightly differently in existentialism than we would in ordinary language? Well, I, I think it comes out of uh, ordinary language but then they, they, they sort of take on uh, specialized senses. So, so basically when we're talking about the absurd, we mean a lack of fit. Uh, between our expectations and the way that the world actually is, right? So anybody who's ever waited online uh, at the DMV or uh, had uh, their uh, heart broken uh, by that cute someone who won't go out with them knows about absurdity. Uh, and meaninglessness, well, most of the, uh, the French existentialists uh, were atheists. And so in terms of meaninglessness, are suggesting that uh, there's not a pre-given purpose to life and so part of the challenge becomes what purpose or meaning can we give it subjectively uh, even if we start from uh, a place where we don't think there's a pre-given divine purpose. So this is a book about free markets or libertarianism and existentialism. So much of it is about freedom and how we ought to understand that and how the state should or shouldn't get involved in it. Um, and so when libertarians broadly, if, if a libertarian talks about freedom, he has in mind something like the absence of coercion um, within lots of necessary further definitions of those terms. But that's a general idea. But that's rather different from the existentialist view of freedom. That's right. The existentialist view of freedom uh, is really metaphysical or ontological uh, and it's the absence of ultimate constraints so that I can always choose to do otherwise. Uh, it has a bit of uh, stoicism about it in the sense that my mind always remains free uh, no matter what the circumstances may be. Uh, Sartre in his 
characteristic hyperbole at one point says that the slave in chains is as free as the master, right? The idea being that the mind remains free, the choice uh, is always there to revolt, uh, even uh, under the worst of circumstances. Okay, so we start with this, this very different concept of freedom. So in this way, existentialism is not a – it's not a political philosophy, I mean at least on its face. But it's often had – its adherents have often chosen Marxism for some reason as their political philosophy and sometimes even justified it on pseudo-existentialism grounds. How, how did they do that and when, why did they do that? Yeah, uh, that, that's one of the strange things about it. Uh, it's uh, a philosophy of individualism and of personal responsibility. And so with that initial description, you'd be inclined to think, well, uh, if there is any political connection or implication, it would be uh, sort of a libertarian one. Uh, but as we find historically, Sartre, Camus, uh, Beauvoir, the, uh, the big ringleaders among the French existentialists were, as you mentioned, uh, Marxists and socialists. Uh, curiously, though, that comes sort of later uh, in their career. It's really after uh, Sartre publishes his magnum opus, uh, Being in Nothingness, and it's really after World War II uh, when, really to, to simplify things uh, to a cultural explanation, the, uh, the bad guys were obviously uh, on the political right, at least as some as as some conceive it, with the uh, the Nazis and the uh, the fascists, and so there was uh, an inclination to look to the political left that that must be where the good guys are, and those were the uh, the Marxists and the socialists. And French intellectual life was dominated uh, by Marxist socialism. Curiously, uh, the leading socialists and Marxists of the time uh, were all uh, condemning Sartre's uh, work, his existentialism, as bourgeois and individualistic and self-involved, uh, but then uh, he turned uh, to uh, uh, advocate for Marxism and socialism uh, and to my mind never really successfully wed the two, although lots of Sartrean scholars would beg to differ with me on that. Now, would you? what about Heidegger though? I mean, he, he, he was a Nazi, I mean, correct? Yes. Yeah. And that, and that, that seems problematic. Sure, that, 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 that's very problematic for anyone uh, associated with him. Uh, Heidegger is in many ways the, uh, the uh, main influence on Sartre's philosophy along with, uh, with Husserl. Uh, and of course, there's lots of ongoing debate about uh, the connections between uh, Heidegger's phenomenology and his politics. Uh, I've never been convinced that there is anything very political about his uh, philosophy. Uh, others beg to differ. This point you make about the um, Sartre's connection to Marxism potentially coming from this like the bad guys are on the right so therefore I'm going to be on the left because I don't want to be like the bad guys was really interesting because first it seems like that explains a lot of people's behavior, <laughs> um, especially in politics is just like the people I don't like believe this so Therefore, that thing is not just wrong, but this alternative must be right. Um, but also, it it seemed odd in light of the the demands for self authorship and and personal choice baked into existentialism to say like, you know, I my job is to be a self author. Um, my job is to critically evaluate ideas and beliefs and not just go along with convention, but at the same time when it comes to really big issues like how we should structure society or the state of the economy, I'm just going to go along with what this tribe happens to think because they're not the other tribe. Yeah, I, I mean it's it's very disappointing in that way, uh, but in some ways not surprising. We, we can all think of examples of other people who, who fit this uh, way of handling things where they look at uh, the people who are identifiably the bad guys and just decide to go in, in the other direction without having thought a lot about it. And there was a lot of uh, social pressure uh, within the uh, French intellectual community for him to do it. Uh, and he moved, Sartre, that is, from having this complete emphasis on individualism uh, to uh, emphasizing uh, the social uh, 
uh, dimension uh, of human experience and the way in which responsibility and freedom are bound up with social conditions, which is something that uh, he wouldn't need to deny and, and that even in his earlier philosophy he accepted, that there is always a situation, there is always a context in which we make our choices, but rather than internalize responsibility, as a libertarian would call for, uh, the, uh, the later Sartre externalizes responsibility uh, by suggesting that uh, we really need to have the, uh, the kind of uh, economic and political structures in place uh, that uh, look out for people and, uh, well, put in place the sort of cradle-to-grave socialism that was coming into place or had been in place uh, already in the Soviet Union. Uh, which he had uh, a flirtation with, and then even uh, Maoist China, uh, which uh, embarrassingly he had uh, a pretty long flirtation with. So, have any of the uh, any of the big existentialists, um, or maybe even small existentialist philosophers, have you ever encountered any of them who flirted with something that might be resembling libertarianism, or at least not complete? Marxism, socialism, is, is there any sort of friendliness to – or at least maybe hatred of the state or like opposition to the state or something that could resemble a kind of more free, less statist kind of philosophy? Yeah, that, I mean that, that's a good question. I, th I think you can find suspicion uh, of power, suspicion uh, of the state. Uh, but uh, the, the, the title uh, of my book is The Free Market in Existentialist because – uh, as far as I've been able to discover, I'm the only person who considers themselves uh, an existentialist. Certainly, I'm not uh, uh, on the level of a Sartre or something like that. I don't mean that, but classifies myself as existentialist and also classifies myself uh, as a free market advocate. The, the closest we, we might come to, uh, to what you're asking for, though, is uh, the person who first introduced Sartre to uh, phenomenology, which then led, led to his development of existentialism, uh, Rayma Naron, uh, who uh, wrote a very uh, important uh, book refuting Sartre's turn toward Marxism, which he titled uh, The Opium of the Intellectuals, which, of course, playing on uh, Marx's uh, famous jibe about uh, religion being the opiate of the people, Aron was suggesting that uh, Marxism uh, had become, and I would say continues to be, the opium of the intellectuals. So let's then move from. I mean, I think you're you provide a pretty compelling case in the book for why Marxism socialism is not a good fit for existentialism, um, and much of the book is then an argument for why free markets are. But before we get to that argument, um, I found I wanted to talk a bit about your critiques of some of the stuff that goes on in markets. So you take you the the anti-consumerism angle of existentialism you take as fairly weighty um, and and something that I think is you think is overlooked by free market people. And so can you tell us what you mean by consumerism and then how that is either incompatible with or detrimental to the kind of life that existentialism thinks we ought to lead? Good. So uh, the, the goal for existentialism is to, is to live a life that in the, uh, the parlance uh, of existentialism is authentic, right? Genuine basically, right? True, honest. Uh, and consumerism is really the, the boogeyman, right? Uh, this is what uh, those on the political left oftentimes see as inevitably wed to capitalism and what makes capitalism so bad. Uh, I'm arguing in the book, though, that capitalism and consumerism don't have to go together. That's actually the subtitle of the book, Capitalism Without Consumerism. Uh, and so by consumerism, I mean this uh, addictive drive or at least potentially addictive drive and desire to have the, the newest, the latest, the best goods and services motivated uh, by a desire to signal one's worth to others and or to uh, feel one's own self-worth, right? The idea being that this is kind of a bad thing, right? There's nothing wrong with consumer products. There's nothing uh, wrong necessarily with wanting certain nice things. But what is bad is if you derive 
uh, your own self-worth from having these things or feel the need to signal your worth to other people, right? This would not be a genuine or authentic way of living, right? And so it's, it's not that even desires uh, are bad things, right? Uh, I liken this to alcohol in a way that uh, lots of people can relate to. Nothing wrong with the desire to, uh, to have uh, a glass of beer, uh, but uh, does the glass of beer end up having you or do you have the glass of beer, right? Do you have a problem with it? Does it get away from you? And, and this can happen as we know, not to everyone, but we look around us and we see that uh, lots of people uh, really aren't living their lives uh, for their own chosen purposes, but are being driven along by whatever uh, the uh, the latest gadgets or the latest status markers may be. Now, with consumerism, though, it, it, it seems like a dangerous line to try and draw because it seems like – the way I use – I hear the word used, generally speaking, is it's one of these terms where no one ever calls themselves it. It's only an epithet used by other people and it's always critical. It's sort of like brainwashed. Like no one ever says, I'm brainwashed. Uh, people always call other people brainwashed by the corporations or the public schools or whatever have you. So can, I mean can the, the line between buying things I – mean, I buy things. Um, I like buying things. Uh, just things that I like, I like buying. It's kind of tautological. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I'm a consumerist. I'm sure I could find some 18-year-old punk rock kid who would accuse me of being a consumerist. Um, uh, I, I, it, I would be very uh, reticent to accuse anyone of being a consumerist. I mean, you know, we could think of you know the per, the I don't know trophy housewife on Rodeo Drive buying a coach bag, but if she gets that much pleasure out of it, then I, I have a hard time criticizing her. So, so where is our stance that we can criticize some things that some people buy under some circumstances? Oh, well, I mean, I think that's an excellent point, and, and you're right. It's a pejorative term that very few people are uh, likely to, uh, to put upon themselves. Uh, I, I liken it to addiction, and I think it shares that uh, in common, right? Uh, nobody wants to be an addict, uh, and very few people who are actively, uh, you know, overusing uh, drugs or alcohol or shopping, for that matter, uh, are inclined to label themselves addicts. Sometimes it's obvious uh, from the outside that somebody has uh, an addiction problem, and sometimes it's not. Uh, but often the best uh, the best judge is uh, is internal. Uh, and, and really the judgment uh, from the free market existentialist perspective needs to be made from uh, the inside. It's not really about judging uh, another person as authentic or inauthentic, but uh, rather uh, adopting this standard for oneself that I want to live uh, an authentic life, right? One that's genuine, uh, true, and self-determined. Uh, and taking a look at the way in which I'm living and saying, uh, Am I am I am I living that way or not? Uh, are are my choices in lifestyle, profession, whatever it may be, are they dictated uh, by wants and desires that I'd really rather not have? Right. I mean, there are wants and desires we have that we fully endorse, and then there may be other wants and desires that we say, "I wish I didn't have that want and desire," and that would be inauthentic to be. Uh, being pushed along by those kinds of wants and desires. So question about this then is the – so if, if not being consumerist would entail following our own wants and desires or not being slavish to these external ones, um, it's going to mean – it's going to mean behavioral changes likely to some extent including say buying less stuff, um, not – necessarily upgrading your iPhone every year when the new one comes out in the fall but instead thinking about whether you really want it and whether you need it and whether you could spend that time and money on other things. And so in that regard, like self-authorship would, would mean buying less stuff. But at the same time, one of the things that capitalism does is by providing us with more stuff and more options for stuff, it broadens the scope of possible lives that we could self-author. You know, just like if 
you're writing a novel, having access to more words means that you can do more with it and take it in more directions than if you have access to fewer words. And so is there a, a tension here where basically the, the variety that capitalism enables us to pursue is to some extent also dependent on people buying more stuff than they need? Sure. I, I think that's a nice way of putting it. There's a tension, uh, though I wouldn't say there's a contradiction, right? Uh, for most people, resisting consumerism may mean uh, buying less than they otherwise do. Or you know, it may not for very many people who uh, are at a very comfortable level of uh, following their, their freely chosen wants and desires. But for example, uh, if one doesn't want to work in a particular uh, field uh, of employment and is only attracted to it because the pay is good, well, that may mean cutting back on, on certain uh, indulgences, right? Uh, whether it be updating your iPhone every year or, or whatever the case may be. So, so the market itself is, is not a bad thing. It's a good thing in the sense that it makes all of these various uh, choices uh, available. But with that comes the potential temptation to, uh, to overindulge. And this, again, I think is uh, a place where uh, existentialism and, and the free market uh, dovetail because one of the, uh, the things that the existentialists tend to emphasize uh, is facing and, and overcoming challenges. And really, uh, th that's the kind of uh, challenge that we meet uh, in the face of consumer abundance, right? So in, in no way am I calling for uh, us to strip down to just three brands of toothpaste, right? Let's have 50 if uh, that's what the market bears. Uh, but uh, really, what we need to be able to make our own choices uh, within that context and, and in a broader context than just toothpaste, come to realize for ourselves, what are our needs and what are our wants uh, and what are our wants really worth to us in terms of the, uh, the time uh, and money that, uh, that they cost us? How demanding is this standard? I mean, as I was reading it, I was thinking about, you know, there's the, the knock against uh, Aristotle's conception of the good human life is that it's, it's really only a life that a small portion of people are capable of living because most people don't have the, the option to sit around in a contemplative state all the time. Um, and this seemed – does this fall prey to the same sort of criticism in that this sort of self-definition and, and doing what you want as opposed to what's forced upon you exercising this existentialist freedom that a lot of people say don't have a choice about pursuing their bliss in the marketplace, about working their dream job because it's just not – available to them. They're working the best job they could get and it may be dreary or low pay or long hours or high stress, but they don't have meaningful choices because they don't have a lot of human capital, say, um, or the you know critically evaluating each thing as it comes along and choosing authentically demands a high level of cognitive capacity, a certain personality type, say, a, a degree of freedom um, or just time and wealth that some people may not have. And so is this – is it a realistic standard for everyday people to meet or is it really – is it more of something that you know, only an elite few could reasonably achieve? Well, that, that, that's a really good question with a, a number of interesting facets uh, that are bound up with it. So. Uh, Sartre uh, speaks about us in, in colorful language as being condemned to be free, right? In the, in the metaphysical, the ontological sense, right? You, the one thing you can't avoid uh, is your own freedom, as the, the sort of cliche has it. Uh, uh, the only choice uh, you, can, uh, you cannot make is to not make a choice. Uh, so it, it, does, uh, it does face us with uh, a kind of a heavy burden as he frames it. And then the standard... Uh, of being authentic, right, uh, is a very difficult one, perhaps a kind of an aspirational goal that few, if any, could really uh, attain. Uh, certainly Sartre doesn't uh, offer himself as an example of someone who does attain it. Uh, almost all of the uh, consideration that he gives to the issue uh, 
uh, is for the negative, right? Uh, what does it look like? What does it mean to be inauthentic, uh, to be, uh, in his language, in bad faith? Uh, very little said about uh, being in good faith, right? Which is really a matter of fully taking uh, responsibility uh, for one's freedom. Uh, and uh, is everybody cut out uh, for this? Will everybody find it attractive? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, but here's a place where uh, I think uh, this frame differs from Aristotle, uh, where Aristotle was, was clearly uh, elitist uh, in suggesting that uh, what he had in mind really was for the very few. Uh, whereas what I'm suggesting here uh, is that while this may not suit everyone or uh, not even suit most people, uh, there's, there's no real condemnation uh, of those who reject it, right? It's uh, an internally consistent uh, possibility, but not an externally demanded uh, standard, right? So if you were to choose to pursue this ideal uh, of authenticity, well then, that, that's your freely uh, chosen possibility, and uh, you yourself uh, then have taken the standards uh, upon yourself. Uh, but in a way, uh, as you nicely point out, it's kind of uh, one of those first world problems or uh, luxury problems that we might have uh, to decide uh, whether or not to pursue this line of work or that line of work, to decide uh, whether uh, we want to drive this kind of car or that kind of car. Uh, those aren't the type of choices that face uh, most people uh, around the world. So uh, in a way, uh, it, it is the kind of thing uh, that becomes uh, a possibility for consideration uh, only under relatively uh, prosperous circumstances. But uh, of course, the, the truth is that with the, uh, the great enrichment over the past 100, 150, 200 years, more and more people find themselves uh, in that sort of luxury position and going forward uh, for the next century and beyond, uh, an even greater slice of the, uh, the human pie will have uh, the chance to face those sort of luxury problems and first world issues. Some people might be listening to this and thinking that uh, the first free market existentialist was Ayn Rand. I mean, there's there's a at least on its face talking about the the authentic life you know striving for living true to yourself and developing yourself as an authentic human being it sounds kind of Randian and, and or more so even Nathaniel Brandon when he went away from from the pure sort of the pure parts of it to just kind of do uh, this his psychology his psychology stuff which was very self help oriented so is it accurate to say that Ayn Rand is an existentialist or maybe kind of an existentialist? Well, the, the, as you probably know, she, she despised the existentialists. Uh, yeah, she but, did. So, <laughs> so it's, it's kind of interesting, yeah. She despised but, libertarians She despised too, everyone. She one, Come on. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I think you're, you're right on in, in making the connection, uh, although she wouldn't express uh, – accept the label. I mean, of course, she's profoundly influenced by Nietzsche, but then, you know, disavows Nietzsche and – uh, there are all kinds of problems, uh, as you point out, with the way in which she uh, she handles her connections with other schools of thought. But uh, yeah, uh, in in the book, I make uh, reference to Ayn Rand uh, on on several occasions, and I think uh, uh, one of them uh, in particular ties into the previous question. Uh, when you think about uh, alienation, right, and being stuck in a certain kind of job or situation. Uh, one model that might come to mind is, uh, is Howard Rourke in, in the Fountainhead when he's working in the quarry. Uh, and uh, here's a guy who is able to take even, uh, you know, this pretty awful uh, work situation and, and find something and make something uh, out of it. Uh, so I, I like the connection with Rand uh, uh, despite the, uh, the baggage that may come along with it. So, so if Rand – the difference here seems though in, in one sense, which is the next part I want to kind of get to, is that Rand has a whole metaphysics behind what she's – an epistemology behind what she's advocating. But but for existentialists, generally speaking, they avoid metaphysics. They, they use – it seems that they use a subjective 
as the criteria for whether or not something is good or just and when they're when they're talking about what should you do next i mean our 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 existentialists as a as a general rule subjectivists on on personal values and the right way of constructing the world is whatever one makes you authentic and no other considerations need apply i i think that's right uh they're starting with Nietzsche, there's a kind of, uh, of a rejection of, uh, of metaphysics. Uh, they move into speaking more about ontology, which is only slightly different. But uh, when it comes to values, uh, values are subjectively uh, chosen. Uh, and, and that's a major point of difference between the existentialists and Rand. And that's where Rand is uh, very much uh, an Aristotelian in, in thinking that there's, uh, there's objectivity to to human value. So as you go to then build this case for free markets uh, from an existentialist standpoint, you begin by disputing moral realism. Uh, and so could you run us through that argument for moral anti-realism? Yeah. So uh, this again is a, is a point of departure from Rand, right? She's mm -hmm. very much uh, a moral realist. Uh, by which we mean that uh, there is objective reality to moral values. Uh, this is easy to root for uh, someone who is uh, a theist, uh, a believer in the traditional loving, all-powerful, all-good God, right? Because these values are rooted in divine will and divine command. Uh, it's also the kind of uh, metaphysics that a, that a Platonist uh, can be at home in, even if the Platonist isn't a theist. Uh, one of the odd things, uh, to my mind, though, is that uh, most 20th century uh, philosophers uh, who've been uh, atheists uh, have also been moral realists without, to my mind, giving a convincing case for where that's actually rooted. Uh, and the case against that, uh, from my perspective, which I, I detail in, in the book, uh, is that there's very good uh, evolutionary explanation for why we have moral feelings and sentiments in terms of our uh, evolved uh, tendency to uh, cooperate and reciprocate uh, in order to live in, in groups, small groups in particular. Uh, so if you have this evolutionary uh, explanation for why we have the feelings and sentiments that we uh, typically label as moral, uh, you don't need any, anything extra metaphysically, right? A platonic form, a divine will, or anything else. Uh, and so, you know, the principle of parsimony or Occam's razor uh, would then shave off that uh, extra metaphysical entity. And so you'd have moral anti-realism, right? We have, yes, these feelings uh, and sentiments, and largely uh, they seem to serve us well, but they're not really rooted uh, in anything higher. And so that opens the door then to uh, subjectivism, right, where uh, I may be uh, sort of prepackaged with the tendency toward certain moral feelings and sentiments, but I can choose to try to develop otherwise, override them, uh, etc. Although that may be no easy task given uh, how firmly hardwired some of these tendencies and feelings might be. So let me see if I can understand that by way of analogy or see if we can distinguish it um, because so I'm sitting at a table right now and have sense data of a microphone in front of me that's attached to the table and can see Trevor across the table from me and I'm, I'm receiving – so I have these impressions of this and this distinct feeling that these things are there and that they're real but I'm receiving them through – eyes and nerves and a brain that are the product of evolution. We can tell a story of how they arrived there. Um, but it's we then we wouldn't say, well, because they're evolutionarily derived and so because I could have evolved differently such that I would have seen them different, it's then not the case that the table or the microphone or Trevor are not real, that they they still are real. It's just that my I've evolved senses for picking up on reality. Couldn't we say the same thing about our, our moral sense or our moral intuition or at least is there a, a strong reason why the existence of an evolutionary origin for those things would be a disproof of their reality? Uh, 
That, that, that's a really good point. Uh, of course, the, the sense experience that you have of Trevor and the microphone uh, is very likely pointing to something there that's real. Uh, what you may be uh, experiencing, though, is not the reality as it actually is, right? I mean, it could be that uh, uh, the colors you see are really just the byproduct of the, uh, the sense data and your hardware, etc. But nonetheless, your, your point remains uh, the case that it, it seems like the best explanation for your experience uh, of Trevor and the microphone is that it's really there uh, and that evolutionarily speaking, it, it probably wouldn't have made any sense to develop uh, the tendency to pick up on things that are not there. Uh, I think the, uh, the uh, analogy uh, that will help to convey my point a little bit better uh, would be a, a kind of an aesthetic one, right? And, and consider a sensory experience like smell, right? Uh, we can all think of uh, smells that we find disgusting, right? Uh, whether it be the smell of uh, feces or vomit uh, or whatever the case may be, right? Uh, and the temptation is there to think that, well, uh, feces uh, smells disgusting because it objectively is disgusting. Uh, but of course, uh, my dog uh, will go right over to that uh, same pile of feces and stick his nose in it. Or uh, dung beetles, yes. That's yeah. just because dogs are disgusting. Yes, you hate dogs. <laughs> Aaron, dogs are not a good thing for Aaron to ever... <laughs> yes. Well, so the, the point being is that there really isn't an objective property of disgustingness there, uh, but it has served as well uh, from an evolutionary standpoint uh, to not behave uh, like the dog and, and stick our nose right in it, right? So the suggestion is that when it comes to, to value judgments in the moral or ethical realm, sure, it, it could be that there really is something there that we're picking up on. Uh, but the simpler explanation would be that uh, it has served us well to react to certain actions, particularly those uh, that are uh, abusive or don't respect norms of reciprocity uh, by uh, expressing disapproval. And that, that can just be codified then uh, in terms of moral judgments, which are much more effective uh, when we say, oh, no, that's not just a matter of our subjective response, but actually is objectively the tr truth, right? whether it's rooted in divine command or some kind of higher reality, uh, that makes for a, for a more effective uh, suggestion that you really need to conform to those norms. See, now this seems really odd. We got to this point now, and, and, and you know, you, we've, this has been a good discussion of moral realism, but in, in moral anti-realism, but You've written a book that is, I mean, kind of an argument for libertarianism, but now you must wonder, well, how can you argue for libertarianism if all these things are subjective and there is no actual – because almost every every moral argument for libertarianism is rooted in some sort of theory of truth. I mean the ones we kind of generally – Property rights. Discuss property rights, that there are things that are just good by some conception of the word good or just or fair. Or owed to you. Or owed to you. Um, if we throw that stuff out the window, um, it seems that the free market existentialist argument is something like um, it's it's oddly selfish, but not in a way of Ayn Rand selfish, where she has a metaphysical and epistemological reason for you to be selfish. It's like you really should really all you really want out of, need out of life is authenticity, and the best form of authenticity for you to get it is through the free market, and so that's why you should believe in free markets. But it's it's there is no further truth beyond that fact that that's what helps you live the rich, existentially rich life. Well, well, right, yeah. What, what I'm arguing for is is a matter of preference rather than uh, any kind of uh, moral ob objective value. Uh, you know, natural rights, uh, any of that uh, dismisses as, as being a bit too too spooky. Uh, and the, the suggestion, again, with, with the, uh, uh, the program is not that everybody would, uh, would want to adopt this free market existentialist approach to things, uh, but it, that it, it may be a preference. Uh, and I, I think uh, that the more one learns about it, the more one is inclined to prefer it. 
Uh, in Kant's terminology, we're talking about a hypothetical imperative rather than a categorical imperative. So it's, it's kind of like uh, if you don't want to get cavities, uh, then you should brush your teeth and go to the dentist every six months. Uh, if you see the, uh, the, the logic of that, uh, then you'd follow along with it. Uh, I don't think uh, the, the logic for uh, adopting uh, an existentialist approach to life or a free market approach to life or the combination of the two uh, is nearly as uh, universally compelling as the logic of brush your teeth and go to the dentist every six months. Uh, but I think it, uh, it holds a, an appeal to me. Uh, and uh, part of the, uh, the idea of the book is, is uh, me trying to find out if it, uh, if it holds an appeal to anyone else or if I really am kind of all alone uh, in this classification uh, of free market existentialists. So in reading the book, I was struck by how clear the connection is between the flow from existentialism to libertarianism, that if it seemed rather obvious that if you accept existentialism as you articulate it in the book, then free markets are a better fit for your views than Marxism or socialism and you gave a, a good story of why the opposite seems to be the case and why so many existentialists were drawn to Marxism. At but least, let me, at least back in the day. At least back in the day. But let me let me flip that around then. Um, so our if our audience is chiefly libertarians and free market people, we don't and you say this, you say you are kind of the lonely example of this. Why don't we see more existentialist libertarians? Mm. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think part of the answer lies in uh, the question that you asked before uh, about Ayn Rand. So those who are inclined in, in an existentialist direction, I think, find a lot of what they're looking for uh, in Ayn Rand. And so you do find this, this combination of views. Uh, and uh, you'll find, of course, plenty of, of libertarians who have uh, – a comfortable relationship with Ayn Rand, despite what she may have said about libertarianism. What you what you won't find, though, uh, is very many people who identify as existentialists, right? So somebody's uh, philosophy professor in college, for example, uh, saying that, uh, oh yeah, uh, that this this makes sense. Uh, your libertarian views. So there there are subtle messages uh, sent to people that uh, these two things just don't go together. Uh, so, and, and one of the other things, and this comes up with uh, some of our, uh, our, our conversation before uh, we even got started, is that uh, American, and the same is true for, for British colleges and universities, are, are dominated uh, by analytic philosophy, uh, which tends to focus on uh, much narrower uh, and language-oriented questions uh, and tends to table uh, the big grand questions about the meaning of life and uh, the nature of free will and living a genuine, authentic life. Uh, more and more in, uh, in American and uh, really English-speaking uh, colleges and universities uh, throughout the world, existentialism doesn't really get any play. Uh, so I, I would think you would find more of those who were uh, libertarian and uh, market-oriented uh, embracing existentialism if they had more exposure to existentialism. And again, that's part of the hope uh, for the book, uh, that I can say enough to intrigue some people to take a look a little bit further at this. Well, be because of the subjectivism part, I mean, it is kind of, it seems like you'd have to be an existentialist first who accepted the basic premises of, of the, school, the school of thought and the subjectivism part of it in order to be amenable to being convinced about libertarianism. The hardest thing I think for convincing libertarians is convincing them that the best argument or, or one of the best arguments for libertarianism would be the – not the objective you know, rights or utilitarianism or whatever but actually just the – it is the best way for you to be an authentic person and that's, that's it, it uh, and you should realize that. So it might be the thing about getting them to give up objectivity which libertarians tend to love. Uh, well, that, that's a very good point and, that, and that's part of what's bound up with, with Rand as well, the promise that we can give you an objective basis for this uh, by which then you can convince just about anybody else if they're willing to, to listen to your reasons. I'm just not saying that. I don't know that you'll uh, 
convince everyone else, nor, nor do I necessarily know that this really is the best uh, life for everyone. Uh, the, uh, the book uh, ends by my sort of imagining uh, an ideal situation in which you had uh, a truly uh, free market uh, state uh, where people could freely choose to be, but it existed in an archipelago of other uh, states where people could choose other systems of uh, government and other economic systems. Uh, I don't have uh, really the, the sense that there's a knockdown objective argument to convince everyone uh, that this option is the option for everyone. Uh, all I can say is here are the reasons uh, that it's a good option for me and, and you might uh, find likewise. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.